Yeah, it's just. Uh, but, so I want to call the finance committee meeting of May 26, 2023 to order. Uh, it's uh, about three minutes after one o'clock. This is posted for a one o'clock meeting. And uh, I'm going to ask the members who are present to confirm that they can hear and be heard in a moment. I just want to remind everybody that this meeting is being held by Zoom. Members of the public have access to the meeting and uh, it's on, also on Amherst Media. Um, please be advised that this meeting is being recorded both visually and um, for um, voice so that uh, you're all, everyone in, who's involved in the meeting, including attendees, are aware of that. Um, so going through uh, the members, uh, Anna. Present. Uh, Lynn. Present. Um, I think Bob is not here at the moment. Matt's not here. Bernie. Present. Kathy. Here. I'm here and we're waiting to see if Alicia will join us too. So, uh, well, Bob just, yeah, Andy, Bob. Bob just joined. Bob is here. Oh, Bob. Sorry, I was sorry, I'm late. Hey, Bob. So, um, why don't we start um, by seeing if uh, any attendees wish to offer public comment? Um, I know that there's one attendee who's um, on the phone. So um, if you're on Zoom, uh, please raise your hand. If you're on the phone, you raise your hand by going star nine. And uh, if you'd like to make public comment, then we will uh, bring you to the meeting so that you can do that. Um, of this. Hello, could you please identify yourself and uh, your sense and then uh, any matter that's uh, it's me, Andy. I, to the committee? It's me, Andy. It's Matt. I, I tried texting Lynn. I'm sorry. I'm out of I'm out of range. I'll, I'll get a okay. better connection soon. But I'm here and I'm present. Okay. Um, so we now can confirm your presence and that you can hear and be. Heard so. Uh, Matt is here. We have one more member of the committee present. And uh, does the uh, if, if the other person who's on wishes public comment, uh, that person can raise their hand and bring them into the room. And otherwise, uh, we should go on to the meeting as we planned. Um, so seeing no request, um, let's uh, go on with the meeting. Uh, real quickly, Andy, Matt, we're, we're just going to leave you able to mute and unmute yourself, and you do star six to raise your hand and unraise it. Okay. Uh, any, any other instructions that you need, Matt? If Matt, are you all set? Yeah, I'm all set. Is my hand raised? I'm sorry. This is no, it's not. And you can, yeah. No, you're good. Okay. Okay. So what we wanted to do today, and I, if another member of the committee joins us, I will repeat this re um, request. But what we first need to do is identify the sections that we separately want to talk about. Um, and we could talk about them because uh, there's a motion that is anticipated that needs to be made during the meeting uh, for consideration. Uh, because in the end, we would presumably um, make a motion to uh, recommend the budget as proposed, except for any areas in which we have stated exceptions or 
added additional comments. So um, as you uh, consider um, whether you want to add any sections for discussion, they don't necessarily have you don't necessarily have to follow it with a motion to um, take any particular position. But if you think that there are special comments that you would like the committee to be making about um, a budget section, even if it isn't going to be a, a motion to reduce um, or change the amount of the budget itself, um, it's worth having that information. So uh, why don't we start there? And um, I'm going to, as I said before, begin by saying the one that I um, will add to the list automatically is uh, the elementary school budget. And I want to specifically acknowledge that the school committee has made a request that we consider um, adding uh, the amount of $84,000 to the recommended budget and uh, that uh, that needs discussion at this meeting. So um, are there other sections? Okay. Not, um, not from not from my point of view, but I didn't hear, as you know, I missed a couple of the meetings. Okay, um, so I say I, um, if other members of the, we have, I guess Alicia is uh, still not with us. Um, and so if she Lynn. joins, so I will re-ask the question. Lynn has her hand up. Yeah, Lynn. And it looks like Matt is uh, trying to contact us. I would like to um, ha make some comments, but not make changes with regard to DPW. Okay, so DPW. And, and it actually ekes over into capital. Okay, okay I'll put both of them down. Um, is separate or you can tie them together, whichever you want. Um, my suggestion, uh, is, it, is anyone trying to contact Alicia? I, I have. I have not heard back from her. Okay, well, let's go ahead and uh, Let's talk about the school budget first, because um, I think that we have a pretty good sense of what the uh, request was. And uh, Allison McDonald was uh, very clear about how they came to the $84,000 and uh, that it was not tied to one of the specific positions but there was a um, at least an implication that it would allow them to add back possibly one position um, of the ones that were supposed to be eliminated for classroom teachers. Um, and uh, just a reminder that the $84,000 uh, was calculated and I actually went through the exercise of pulling out the numbers and doing this myself. And, you know, it is absolutely correct uh, that if you, if you were to take the amount that's between two and a half and 3% increase and the section, the amounts that were added for the uh, element or for the town departments, the operating budgets, and the library operating budget, and you proportionately divide that between the regional schools and the elementary schools, the part that's attributed to the elementary school would then be $84,000. And that was what she said, and that is the correct number for my calculation. So I just want to point that out. So 
Kathy, your hand is up. Yeah, um, as you know, I, I missed that discussion and I didn't go back and I apologize. I didn't go back and um, watch the Zoom. So just to repeat what you said, it's designated for staffing. It's not designated for salaries at all. So it was not at all on a increase the para professional pay. It was around a staffing, potential staffing position. That's the way um, they are, the school committee articulated 84,000. That's a question. Um, yeah. I'm not sure that it was exactly said that way. That was an implication, but um, I'll say I'll I'll give a response and then see if Sean agrees um, or had, had a different interpretation. Um, what came up was is that superintendent said that the additional amount above the the uh, was recommended by the town manager for the additional half percent between two and a half and three percent, which is roughly 118,000, I believe, um, that he wanted to not designate that for expenditure immediately, but to put it into a salary reserve pending negotiations. And the other piece that was added by the school committee was not necessarily tied to that. Um, and the um, I don't recall that there was an, a specific statement about how the eighty-four thousand dollars would be used. Um, it was more how it was calculated and a very um, strong statement about uh, the breadth of the cuts that were being proposed to. Um, two class by cutting two classroom teachers, and I believe it was four paralegals, including three library uh, para I mean paraprofessionals and three library para para professionals. And so that's where they were uh, where where I tied it together. Um, Matt, your hand is up. So. <clears throat> yeah, I wanted to make a, a just a quick comment, Andy, which is. Um, it's always helpful to have the background, the context on the school budget, uh, but I think we all know that you know we kind of we approve a bottom line amount, and then it's up to the you know the superintendent ultimately to, mm -hmm. to at their discretion. So I feel confident if you if you ran that comparison that Allison made, and you feel confident that this is sort of our fair share against the regional school district's allotment, then to me I'm su I'm supportive of that without getting into the details of which para is getting paid you know out of which account. I, I don't think that's our really our purview. Yeah, no, it is, and I agree that ultimately anything that we, as a town, uh, provide to the schools, it's up to the schools to make that decision through their own processes. Sean? Yeah, and, um, you know, ultimately the school committee did not decide to ask for the additional funds at the regional level. They only decided to ask for it at the elementary level, um, which I, you know, thought was interesting that they weren't going to ask the other member towns to contribute more, um, but they would go to the elementary school for it. So um, just interesting that they didn't ask for it at the region, which, you know, has similar financial um, uh, issues this year as the elementary school. Bernie? Yeah, um, I, I was wondering about this, Steph. Uh, when they built the budget, the funding for the budget, were they looking at the original House One um, Chapter 78 versus what is now being debated and discussed in conference committee? Um, at, the, I don't, at the elementary I don't have, level, they don't um, they don't worry about revenues so much. Um, they just worry about whatever guidance we give them. Um, yeah, at the regional level, they they certainly look at Chapter 70 and um, regional transportation aid. But at the elementary level, um, they, they get an allocation from us. So we look, we are concerned about that. And our original two and a half percent, you know, was based on the uh, was based on the house. Well, actually, it was based be even before we got the governor's budget. Uh, OK, so so the question is, is that with with the changes that have happened in the budget process right now, or, or is the elementary schools likely to get uh, $84,000 or some portion thereof um, in state aid. 
No, because the state aid comes to the town. It doesn't yeah. come. Right. To the yeah, this is no. yeah for the elementary level. It comes yeah. to us. It um, comes to us, right? But it's it's earmarked. No, it is not earmarked. We, well, and, it kind um, of. It, it kind I, of I, is, but we give so far above and beyond what we get from the yeah, state uh, that we never have to worry about it. Um, you know, there's a certain amount we have to spend on schools related to the Chapter 70 formula, but again, we're many, you know, much, much more so, than that. So, so again, the with, with the the present allocation from the Commonwealth, assuming nothing changes, the conference committee is there is there more than. Um, what was originally projected for uh, Chapter Seventy? I, I haven't I haven't looked recently, so uh, I don't know. I'm so when we when we went to the three percent, we factored in um, some of the positive changes that have come out of the budget proposal so far. Um, going from thirty, you know, depending on where the the final budget ends, you know, between thirty dollars per pupil or sixty dollars per pupil, um, that might be a little bit more money, but to the tune of about thirty thousand um, dollars. Okay. Um, but again, the, you know, our long practice uh, that served the town well in terms of budgeting is that that goes to the town. We review all of our revenue sources, and then we we allocate what it, we feel is sort of an, uh, a sustainable operating budget increase to each department, the you know, the region, the elementary schools, library, and town. Okay, thanks, Kathy. Um, I'm I want to frame this as a question rather than as a suggestion of what to do. So. Could we word this that um, to the extent that the chapter 70 funds come in higher than what we have in the budget and the budget guidelines, uh, we recommend that the town manager consider what can be done to address the school re committee request without saying all of it. But, but it, so I left it that they wouldn't the town manager wouldn't have to come back to us that we would be recommending to the council this kind of wording so can we do wording with that and and sean i understand that typically the town manager has full discretion so it might say if you know twenty thousand or thirty thousand more comes in it could be spread everywhere um so i i'm just asking that uh could we word it in this way and would that be too restricted or can we word it that we're it's a recommendation rather than a um in, in directive um i i think um is it okay if i respond to that andy yeah i mean either one of us could but go ahead um you know if more money comes in the town manager can't just spread it out it has to go through the appropriation process you know just like any other you know once the budget's set um but i think that what the town manager has done in the past and i imagine he would be open to as well is when we get to the fall if revenues are um you know materially better than what we were expecting them to be um consider a supplemental appropriation or some action like that like we did last year um, again, if chapter 70 comes in 20 or $30,000 more, um, when you think about the grand scheme of a $90 million budget, there's a lot of pluses and minuses that could happen throughout the year. Um, yep. but last year, the, the governor's, the final state budget was materially better, um, cause they doubled the amount of unrestricted general government aid. Um, so again, if something like that happens, I think the town manager would, would take that into consideration in the fall again. It's in what we were, uh, what was being described is kind of, I would say, long standing town policy. Because when I was on the finance committee, which Bernie was before you were on the finance committee, we certainly had these discussions at that time. And, uh, you know, sort of along the lines of recognizing that the minimum required contribution from, um, municipality that we were so far above and beyond that and we were obviously using tremendous amounts of um, other revenue including um, property taxes that uh, the chapter 70 uh, amounts were just treated as a revenue source and not separately accounted for in the uh, calculation. 
And uh, so we have been, I think, historically um, giving for each uh, portion of the operating budget an equal percentage increase. And that, you know, we're not bound to that, but it has, it is what we'd say is longstanding practice. Matt? Thanks. Yeah, and I'll speak to that. I mean, I just briefly, I, I agree that um, Chapter 70 is one more revenue source for, for our community. I, I would say it's not um, minimum net spending just is not going to be really super relevant for us, um, thankfully, I would say. But Sean, can you clarify? Uh, I, maybe I got confused by what Andy was. Can you clarify? So the so the explanation for why we went up, why the um, school committee request went up to Amherst, but not to the regional. Could, would you, could you just reiterate that? So Allison McDonald made the case to us that we we should be making an eighty-four thousand dollars proportionate increase, but proportionate to what then? Yeah, so, so the the eighty-four thousand dollar increase was only to the elementary school request, um, or to the, to the guidance that was given to the schools, um, not to the region. So the region there, what they voted came in right on the guidance that was given to them, um, but the elementary school level came in eighty-four thousand higher, and the way they got to that number was they. Um, took the value of a half percent increase, which is um, the, what we kind of came out with as a secondary guidance was an additional half percent. They took that value um, and then they prorated it sort of based on the elementary share of total education spending versus the regional share of total educational spending. Um, I think originally the plan was to request more funding at both levels, um, which is would make sense why they did it that way. Um, but ultimately they didn't decide to do that at the regional level. So the guidance that that half percent guidance came out of town manager's office, is that correct? Yeah, so the, uh, we sent an email out um, and I apologize, this, I may not have um, included you, Bob and Bernie and I should have, um, but I forget exactly what month it is, but we issued our original guidance. And then when we saw the governor's budget, um, we came out with an extra half percent because we felt the the, revenues we we updated our revenue projection with the the numbers there okay so i mean i i, I find that compelling but i also you know would like to hear the rationale behind not going to the other towns on that the one other thing i was to say just a general cautionary tale um you know typically in the past the governor's budget has been sort of the low point and and senate and house build upon that um it doesn't you know now that we have a Democratic governor, we don't know if that will be the case. And there were some things that um, were lower in the House's budget than in the governor's budget, which is an interesting twist because that hasn't always, the, the past history for recent history hasn't been that way. Um, so it's just one of those sort of assumptions that we take for granted that we have to consider, will it always be the low point going forward? Uh, Lou? Yeah, so I also got the impression that they felt that by the time this was communicated, the regional budget was very close to be being set, discussed, and the four towns had already met and agreed to the guardrails and everything else. And so uh, I that was my sense of why they didn't come in for the regional. Uh, along with all the other pieces that Sean and, and Andy have mentioned. Um, I mean, the way we dealt with this in the past is we've said that when we have, uh, when we certify our, and obligate our free cash, and I just keep wanting to not use the word free cash because of the conversations we've had, um, that we consider giving more to the schools. That, that's what we did last year. When we did that, as you may recall, we actually did give more to the regional schools, but we had to give it as a gift because um, we, if we gave it as part of our appropriation, then the other partners in the regional school would have had to do the same. So that's how we handled it last year. Um, I, I think the, um, the thing that still is unsettling for me in this whole discussion is the fact that we don't have a contract. Uh, there isn't a contract yet with the APEA. And so we're not really clear what salary levels are there, are, are going to be there. And um, 
this, so it, that's part of the reason why if we're going to do anything, I would prefer we do it when we have free cash. When we have certified free cash, which by the way, do not be fooled by the last couple of years where we've had really high certified free cash. I just don't know that we're gonna be looking at those levels of numbers like we saw in the past. I think, uh, the, you know, just the implication of what um, the school committee position was on it is that their needs are so great that they should have gotten the entire increase to, that, that was being given out between two and a half and three percent in the the second part of that implication is then that the library and the town departments uh, should have been just held to the two and a half percent increase so that they could be getting a little bit higher than the three. I think it takes them up to like 3.1 something percent, if I recall. It's not, it wasn't a huge difference, but uh, that was, you know, the implication was is that their need was greater. And, you know, I don't know that uh, we really felt comfortable. I felt comfortable, I guess I should put it in my terms only, that I felt comfortable going there because I think that it undersells some of the stress that is on other town uh, and library departments. I can't speak for the library, but looking for at the municipal departments, I was comfortable with that conclusion. But um, I understand that there was that argument. And um, I think that that is part of uh, the reason that town manager proposes that uh, as soon as uh, we get past the budget that we convene, uh, that he convene a group that is a combination of uh, school and uh, municipal to talk about uh, what is the uh, plan for funding and education and recognizing the high stress on education and how we're dealing with that. Sean might have a better sense of that. So I'm in his hands up anyway. So turn it back to you, Sean. Yeah, no, I was just gonna say exactly what you're referencing, which um, I think the town manager's approach is um, it seemed it seemed like this request it wasn't initially in the superintendent's budget. It seemed like it was sort of a that night of the meeting type thing, um, and so I think the town manager's approach is that he, he acknowledges there there are struggles there, there, especially at the regional level. They've been there for for several years, um, which is why we're proposing this group, um, and we're going to probably get started uh, as soon as school gets out. Um, we'll start meeting with school folks and town folks to start coming up with a broader plan, which, again, I, you know, we chose our words carefully in what was being proposed. It, it may include more revenue in the future. You know, there may be a time in the uh, for the upcoming cycle where um, the school increase is larger than the town increase uh, for a certain period of time. Um, but I think the thought process is, that, that's a good idea if it gets us to a place where the schools get to a sustainable level. Um, and so there's gonna there's another side of that where we have to look at efficiencies. And so if we can do efficiencies, possibly some more revenue for a few years and get them to a balanced place um, where we're not having this sort of annual discussion. I mean, that, there's always gonna be years where there's reductions to be made, but I think this year uh, because of the grant impacts, um, it, it, you know, both districts are looking at larger than typical or larger than we'd like to see um, reduction. So that's the the plan is to come up with a balanced approach that includes possible revenue increases and expense uh, operational efficiencies um, to address this sort of systematically as opposed to this kind of feels like kind of a one year band aid. So I guess where we are at is that. Uh, we can leave it that uh, without a motion, but just to report that we had the discussion, or somebody can make a motion that can go either way. I'm not feeling strongly on the uh, on that question, but I I do want to include in the report at least a brief statement that we've had this discussion and would 
uh, were, were uh, the kinds of issues we raised during the discussion. But if we uh, end up with a motion to adopt the budget as recommended by the town manager, it sort of is a recommendation. So it will be encompassed in the final motion. Is there anything more to be said on schools? Otherwise, I want to turn it to uh, Linda Asko, what she wants to discuss with DPW and Capital, which was the two that she had raised. Lynn, go ahead then. I, I don't want this to sound harsh, but it's going to, okay? I want a five-year aggressive plan to get ahead of our road problem. And I, whenever we brought this up, we hear, well, it's state money and we can only get so many contractors. Somebody needs to be thinking outside the box. I've heard this from Matt. I've heard it from other people. I, I'm not even getting a response to reporting on plot holes right now. So it's it's beyond what our community can continue to tolerate. And so my request is not a budget request in this year's budget. It is, you are gonna hear this from me again when we get to free cash certification, but it is to think more broadly and in a more long-term vision of how we get ahead of this problem. Thank you. Matt? Just very quickly, um, a question or a suggestion, which is to me, um, this requires maybe, I don't know, does our town, do we do ad hoc committees within our town town council? That's an, that's an honest question for the councilors. I mean, you know, this, to me, this is the sort of thing that will require obviously a lot of work on, you know, on, on town staff, uh, but but I think, you know, really engaging with the community and and sort of building community will around this because it's it will be expensive. I, I mean, you know, even if we can come up with the most creative thing that has regional cost sharing, everything else, it's going to be expensive. And and I just think there's a there's a you know so called political component to it that I that um, that I, I think we would really need because you know it, it is such a ex expensive proposition and complicated too. Nothing. I'm I'm very comfortable with making us that is a strong recommendation. I also think that we've asked repeatedly, and I understand the reasons why it changes, but a schedule so that people can understand what's coming next. So it's instead we're pleasantly surprised when um, certain potholes are fixed um, and. See here, click works sometimes. It works particularly for some voices. So, so just it um, more of a plan. And I'm just going to give you the most recent ex example. There's there's work being done on North Pleasant Street, just below the intersection, where there's a movement of the bus station. There's some stuff marked for sidewalks. And it came as a complete surprise to everyone whose house is there. And so they have been writing to the town manager that um, they're seeing the markings and there's a plan for, and I think it came before the council, Lynn, at some point, but we never completely agreed to what, and it's, it's not fixing a chronic problem. It's in making an improvement. So I'm just thinking just the plan, the plan should be, more transparent on what's going to happen next rather than a few residents saying, oh, it looks like you're planning on doing some work. Um, what is the work you're planning on doing? So, it, and it, it wasn't cheap work. So I just want to say it was intensive work. So I think it would be a really useful piece because um, there's some inexpensive things people are asking for even a whether it's a speed hump or a slowing of uh, or slowing of traffic policy that we don't really ever know when anything is going to be addressed 
let alone a five-year plan. So I'm comfortable with making a statement like that. Bernie? Well, well, we do have the town, and, and I, I spent a couple of years sitting on the Transportation Advisory Committee. Um, so some of these improvements are a surprise. They're stuff that's been discussed by the TAC uh, with DPW, and they're, they're, they are intended to make life easier in terms of traffic movement and safety and uh, a variety of other things. So you have the situation of you have improvements versus uh, maintenance versus repairs. Uh, we have a pavement management plan. It would be helpful to have that pavement management plan and pieces of it get posted, but have it have it out there so that people understand what's going on and understand which parts of the pavement management plan are intended to continue to repair the roads maintain the roads and which pieces of it are improvements that people would like to see um, would make life easier, uh, make life safer, <clears throat> but might get overwhelmed by, uh, you know, the need to, to basically repair big sections of the road. Um, I don't have, uh, you know, I can certainly support putting together a plan like this. And, and I think it might be actually helpful um, if there were a clear set of priorities for DPW, this, this is what you, you know, this is what you work on. Um, they operate in sort of a crazy quilt situation where you've got uh, MassDOT um, coming up with all sorts of wonderful grant programs uh, that don't necessarily meet the maintenance and repair needs that the town has. Uh, and they're tempted to go for those because they help, um, they help the town. So sitting down and setting some priorities uh, would, would be a, a good thing, taking a look at what we have in place right now to do pavement management um, would be a good thing. And so I can certainly I can certainly support that. But folks also have to recognize that in terms of the ability to do this work, uh, we have a limited number of options, companies with the machines uh, and the crews and the supply of materials. So um, once we get a plan, once we get a plan in place, a five-year plan in place, there are going to be some um, difficulties in in implementing it based on um, how competitive the world is at that point in time. And I, I'm also thinking right now that you know we've got um, the, uh, uh, the 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 infrastructure funding that's coming down from the feds. Um, that's gonna that's gonna be competing with us in our ability to actually uh, hire companies in that can do this, they do these kinds of repairs. So, um, you know, let's, by all means, let's sit down and set some priorities and let's take a look at um, what we do have, on, uh, what we do have for a plan right now. Yeah, Pete. Yeah, I, Bernie, I just want to, uh, your mention of TAC, TAC has directly reported that their advice and their policy papers aren't always being re followed either. They, yeah, they, no, that's, just, so that's, I'm, just, I'm just saying that it's, you know, so when I say the na the residents were surprised, TAC is sometimes surprised that there oh, was- no, I, I certainly agree with that. And and I, the TAC folks work very hard. Um, we, yeah. we, you know, we, we spent a lot, when I was there, we spent a lot of time walking around. And, and looking at things and people are very careful and planful and, and there's some real expertise in that committee. And no, the, the committee's not always listened to and that was a constant complaint and I could certainly voice it that, uh, uh, you know, TAC would, would come up with recommendations and, and try to push stuff up the ladder and it wouldn't go anywhere. Yeah, so uh, I, mean, I, I was just saying that, that it, my point was a more transparency both on roads and on other work that we know what's mm -hmm. coming. So it, mm -hmm. instead of, people being surprised. Um, yeah. So I'll just, yeah. Yeah, I'm going to call Lynn. I had a comment on the transparency thing, but I wanted to go ahead and if Lynn go first. Um, let me just add, I believe that this year, um, DPW went further by sharing the road assessments that we have. That's part of the plan. And 
understanding what's out there. But I firmly believe that if we have a five-year plan and we go out and shop that five-year plan, whether it's by ourselves or with others in the region, then you create an incentive for the existing companies to gear up. And, but if we don't do something, we're gonna be driving on dirt roads in much, in much of our town. I mean, there's just no question about it, so. Yeah, my one comment was going to be, uh, and this goes back to what I've heard from uh, Guilford Bar and Jason Skills both, is that they will uh, make changes in a plan if they have reason to, and the example that they give is that if they see a road that is beginning to deteriorate, but they can intervene now and do it with less costly repair than if they wait a year and then um, it becomes so bad that they just have to do a total uh, reconstruction of the road, which is a lot more expensive, that they may take the opportunity to do the lesser work before more deterioration sets in. Uh, and that I think that they've become, and they say that because they're a little bit hesitant to advertise to the public that we're gonna do your street in 2026, uh, because if 2026 rolls along and the, they had to make those changes for that reason, then they uh, get uh, tons of comments from the people who are affected but you promised my road and uh, that that's part of why they've been resistant to a real specific plan. Anna? Yeah, Andy, you, you brought up a point I was, um, I was thinking about too of, of the promising of dates, right? We know that things fluctuate so fast that we will either run out of uh, time or money or both often. Um, and so I think that it was, I think something that's sticking with me, Lynn, is in hearing this is thinking about the presentation that we got from Jason Skills at TSO last year. Um, and we're asking them to come back to TSO in the near future. And so um, it might be appropriate actually to call that as a joint meeting of the council if enough counselors are interested to um, really get into this topic. I think that that's uh, a good starting place for it. And, and I also found it really helpful to see the formula that they were using to classify road conditions too, um, because it, it helped me when talking to, res to, to residents about the, the problem and how, how things were prioritized and the fact that there is a metric, that it's not just squeakiest wheel, um, it's, it's most broken axles. So um, that's, that's my terrible joke on road conditions and I will stop there, but I do think that it would be helpful to, to bring this to that particular meeting with Jason and to call it as a joint meeting of the council. Lynn? Calling, calling it as a joint meeting of the council is up to the chair of the committee, which is fine with me. I think that would be a good place to start. I also want to make sure people understand plans are plans and then they get adjusted just like strategic plans get re-looked at every year right now it's not clear to me we have a plan and it's not aggressive enough to do what we need to do that's my bottom line so where uh, bob has written a draft of dpw section so I, I appreciate that i've received several drafts already um, and uh, maybe what I should do is take a look at it and maybe um, bring Lynn into taking a look at it too. And uh, so that uh, we see if we can incorporate some of this concepts that we're talking about today, but along the lines of uh, adding the uh, recommendation that came from the discussion about developing a long-term uh, and aggressive plan on dealing with our road problems and uh, 
the uh, possibility of uh, taking this back to TSO um, with the next TSO discussion and making that a um, open to all um, counselors so that all counselors can participate in this very important discussion. Of course, other members of the finance committee should be invited into that too. Uh, and see how that flows because the idea was is to take today's discussion if it didn't involve a specific motion like uh, uh, changing amounts that we would try and incorporate it into the report we can get it so that we'd be discussing a draft report on the 30th uh, if that's the plan we should just keep going with it um, so let me go back to people who've raised hands and uh, those, Sean, why don't you go first? Oh, I was just going to say um, everything sounds, all this sounds good. I would say a lot of it sounds like things that should probably be in the town manager's goals um, for the fall. Um, but I think this year's budget proposal, which the recommendation um, primarily relates to, is the largest ever investment in roads. So, um, and, and I think the comments are probably more to the capital improvement program and what you see coming down the road as not being sufficient. So I think everything sounded good and just don't lose sight that um, there wasn't a lot in the last round of goals for town manager around roads. And um, sounds like that should be a emphasis for the next round. Uh -huh. You muted, Bob. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Um, I, I did put a section on roads in my write up. Um, I basically put down that we've got a $40 million deficit. That it basically, it needs to be filled. Um, there were sort of three ideas kind of floated. One was to borrow the money and you know, pave the roads. The second was to have a in-house crew that basically would pave roads as needed. And the third, I think was Matt's suggestion that we kind of create a, or work with other towns, create a regional uh, demand for, um, for roads um, that would, you know, overcome this evidently evident problem that we have, which is a lack of asphalt production, a lack of train crews um, in the private sector that, uh, you know, everyone's competing for. And so that's just going to drive prices up and you're not going to be able to get, even if we had $40 million to spend, there's no way we could get $40 million worth of asphalt, you know, in a certain amount of time. So we have a, a real serious problem here. I, I, that's what I put and I sort of put that, you know, maybe we should discuss this regional option more because it seems to be the only path forward. In other words, if you create a demand for more asphalt, maybe the private sector will build another plant or, you know, build more plants. But I agree, it's a it's a real problem. Um, you know, I, I drive on Old Farm Road. Well, I, I don't even drive on Old Farm Road anymore. Um, it's just it's just one a section there is just all potholes. There's no road left. Um, you'd be better off to just throw a bunch of dirt down <laughs> on top of the potholes. At least it would be uh, you know be better surface for a few days. Um, so you know it's it's a real problem, and I don't see where we're going to get forty million dollars to solve this problem unless we cut it somewhere else or raise taxes. I mean we don't have that's what that's what our choice is. So. It's a real problem. I, I do think it requires a lot of attention. Um, and, um, you know, I'd be happy to, uh, you know, upgrade the, the what I wrote or have other people edit it uh, and, uh, you know, make more emphasis on this. Thanks. Um, we recognize Bernie, and then I have a question I'm going to ask Sean after that. Um, you just, just as an, in a side, uh, uh, while I was managing Deerfield, we permitted and had built a, an asphalt plant, which is where I got a uh, an unwanted but necessary uh, introduction to making asphalt. Um, and, and the you know what's happened is is over time uh, the, the big companies like Allstate have just rolled up 
a lot of the small providers and uh, smaller companies. And, and so it's, it's become more uh, agalop, agalopolistic. At any rate, um, my, I'm also wondering how much MassDot could help with this. Um, you know, the, the, one of the big problems for any contractor is uh, uh, lining the job up, getting all the crews and everything in place. You know, mobilizing for the job, and you frequently you you know you drive uh, uh, through where the roundabout's going to be built now at Pomeroy Lane. You see equipment sitting there, uh, and that's a mobilization issue. And so, if we're going to do, uh, if, if we could work with MassDOT, if we could work with some contiguous communities to give uh, uh, companies a break in terms of of the time it takes to mobilize and the cost it takes to mobilize. That would be one way that we could move this along, I think. Um, it's probably easier said than done, uh, but we haven't tried as far as I know. And I think it's a, it, it's, it's a good idea to do that. The idea that the town would have its own paving crew, um, you're looking at a serious capital investment, serious, serious capital investment in the equipment that it takes to do that work. Um, and you're also looking at a, a hiring, um, you know, a crew of people who are specialized in, in in doing that. So I don't see that as a it's an it's an it's a thought, but I don't see it as a way forward. Uh, I do agree that our present, you know, situation is um, really unsettling and uh, needs to have something moved along. And I won't bore anybody with my David quote about picking up the trash and paving, filling the puddles. And you actually triggered an interesting additional piece besides what I was going to ask Sean, and then I get uh, so let me get through that. But uh, that is uh, whether uh, it'd be worth talking with within the uh, MMA about um, whether the MMA would want to <laughs> consider um, asking for uh, greater. Mass DOT participation in the process for all uh, municipalities, so that uh, there's a crew that's actually uh, a publicly created crew that uh, we then have a greater control on this municipalities and the greater claim on. I don't know if that would work or not, but the question I was going to ask you, Sean, is that. Um, we also have the reality that people who have substantial damage to vehicles because they've driven over roads that uh, are in poor repair and we've had prior knowledge of that problem and it then causes damage to a vehicle, people can make insurance claims. Is there any information available um, either through the uh, treasurer's office or through the from the insurance company about the total amount of those claims that are paid in any given period of time yeah i'm sure we get a report annually um on our uh, all our claims uh whether it be from that type of uh submission or some other so yeah we, we have that information because i wonder if it'd be worth uh getting that information and adding it to the record of this discussion. I'll see if I can find it while you guys are talking. Matt? Oh, I don't want to go too far down this path, but I, I realize since the ideas are getting floated in, in the attribution, but um, I will just I will just say that, you know, I have some experience in the public sector and totally unrelated kind of field, but, you know, sometimes going private contract contracting the workout you know obviously is this is this huge expense but you have you know you, you're not saddled with long term um the expenses of, of you know a long term operation but i was my i was just going to say that my my initial suggestion was actually that if we if we were able to create a crew that we could set aside some percentage of that crew's working time to uh be a revenue stream or with other communities. And, and I realize that you wouldn't be able to totally offset the cost of that. And I realize you'd get complaints about people saying, well, why is Amherst crew, you know, working, but, but it, it can become a revenue source as well as a, um, you know, an, an in-house asset. I, that being said, I'm not, 
I'm not actually advocating for the idea. I just wanted to kind of articulate this brainstorm idea. Um, and, and I do think, you know, since, since Bob is going to include some of these ideas in his draft, I just wanted to kind of lay that out a little bit more clearly because I, I think I was not exactly what I had said. Um, but I, yeah, I think that, that this requires a political, some political will and, and frankly, just a, a larger, you know, political consensus on how to, how to move forward. Thanks. Okay. So if there's nothing else, uh, Sean comes up with something, you can come back to it. Uh, but is there anything else that anybody wants to say on this? Or shall we give it a, just give it a try to uh, take uh, what Bob has written and just see uh, if it covers it sufficiently or what changes we might want to make? And I'll work with Bob and whoever else to try and get that done. Uh, Pat, just your hand still up. Lynn? I, I want to thank people for the conversation and the fact that we're already down the road of including it in the report. And I want to give Bernie the award for the most unusual word I've heard <laughs> in a meeting. <laughs> okay, so... Um... Let me bring up one other topic unrelated to all of this because Alicia, um, or right, Kathy, I see your hand up before I add enough that, words. That's okay. I, this is just um, since I'm pl playing catch up, my section, I just want to cross check with Bernie. I think my section is conservation planning inspection and Bernie's taking general government. Is that correct? Even though I sent in all those questions, good. So, the, so well, all the, those questions, yeah, all those questions did. are real helpful. But Andy got my draft uh, yesterday, okay. and I, I did so, uh, so the, the general government piece. So, so the comment I want to make because I did that extra section and this is I wanted Andy somewhere at the beginning of the report to talk about, and and I'll talk about it in my section. But there. We're we're working staff double time in the town serve in town. Um, you know, many people are performing more than one job, and we're what work. We've been working short staff in the planning department just because we were down to. So I want to do that. The town town staff is amazing, but also just put in a plug that we had this longer run problem with market wages and turnover, and it's cutting across departments. We just. We just, the town, I don't have any idea whether it was a salary issue, Sean, but our public health director just resigned. And she's been here maybe a year, but you know, it's, but, but there's been a, several of them in, in, and, and we've had turnover in other positions. So I just wanted, it's an overarching point because we've heard a lot from the schools, but we haven't heard a lot from DPW and engineers and town staff, both on a, the way people are working. So the the question of not new positions, but just you know making sure we're using the people and our resources well, is cutting across my th three areas. But I think it cuts across all of these um, to make it a, a general piece rather than any particular department. So that was just I don't know how to work that in, but it's a cross cutting piece that particularly when I heard, you know, where we have the Department of One on sustainability, um, that we make it work because more people are working on sustainability. It's not just one person, but the, the fact that we do teams effectively is, is a good model. I have no criticism of it, but I just wanted to make that remark. Um, so. Bernie? Real quick, I, I mentioned uh, in my report um, concerns about staff turnover and competition from other sectors, and I, I, I really agree with what Kathy said. I, I think it's a it's a challenge. I think we have people who are working very hard, um, and um, uh, I, we, we need to take a good look at how we're how we're organized. In um, so, I'm just very supportive of what she said. Uh -huh. Yeah, I, I just want to echo this. I, I also put in a piece in the DPW on this, um, and it's a it's an issue. I I agree. I think we should 
elevated as a major issue the town has to face and it cuts across all departments and you know we you know i i think i put it you know you know kind of plainly speaking or sim simply speaking people can get better jobs in the private sector or bigger towns period you know and as long as we have that situation we're not going to get a stable workforce um it's just not going to happen so i agree it's a big it's a problem that we should elevate I get, do get the sense that we're not alone in Amherst, that other municipalities are facing the same thing, and uh, that's MMA is well aware of it. And, no, and I, I agree, but I think it's important for the whole council to see this coming from finance and with the council to do it. So, um, you know, I was told that in the town manager's discussion with whoever it was, they came in with seven positions to add and said, what if we can only do one, which would you pick? And they said seven. Um, so, <laughs> so just, you know, so just to, to make this that, that what we're doing is pretty amazing with the staff we have, but to be aware of the challenges, and I would use those words um, uh, uh, across the board. So. Okay. Thank you. It's good. I, I think that is a good note. Thank you. So the other section that I um, I was hoping that Alicia would be joining us because I think that this was what I um, would have thought might be her issue. Uh, and Anna's going to be writing this, uh, the DP, uh, the uh, public safety section. And uh, you know, there was discussion that we had during the uh, presentation of those departments about where we're going with crest staffing and the importance of not, uh, at least from the police department's report, the consequences of uh, any reduction in police department and uh, trying to uh, just recognize both. Uh, and I was hoping that she would be here, for, which I was why I didn't want to raise the question to begin with. But um, Anna, I don't know. I'll leave it to you as to whether you feel comfortable enough now to write your section, or would you, whether there's anything that you would like input from the committee on. I think. Uh, I don't know if Kathy wants to, I, I'll respond quickly. I, Andy, my plan was to take a stab at it, um, finishing it. I'm working on it today and uh, sending it to you and getting any feedback from you. But um, I think that I don't have any questions for the committee at this point. And I, yeah, we're gonna see how it goes. Okay. Thank you. Kathy? And this was again, one I missed, but I will read your draft on it. Cause one of the things I think is, um, I believe in understanding the potential use and staffing for peak loads. Um, so I don't think we know enough yet with Cress. And those were some of the questions I really set in on. On we're we're developing a program, and I'm one of my concerns. It's not a big concern, but at one presentation, um, that we don't want to take over work that volunteers have been doing for years. Um, you know, particularly around senior senior center, you know, meals on wheels, delivering meals, um, home visits, where it makes yes. And um, when I was looking at some of the volunteer work for meals on wheels, and since they're all in the bank center, there's a, a great tendency to say we can help, we can jump in, but that says says Cress. But it also means that people are sitting there right now, there's not a demand on their time. Um, so we just need to be be careful. Because the senior center for years has run with a very robust volunteer program on um, home visits, wellness visits, uh, meals on wheels, um, that they don't do it with their own staff. So, so, so that would be when I read it. Um, you know, I think it would be premature to know exactly how we will need to be staffed until we get enough of a, a flow kinds of tasks they're doing and the demands on their time. So that's my 
going in before I heard a conversation comment on it. And I watched it, you know, and I should just say out of my healthcare background from years ago, when nurse practitioners and physician assistants were still co first coming in and people were figuring out what they could do, it took practices a while to figure out how that, that interacted with physicians and to what, what the right teams were. Um, you know, in terms of uh, ta tasks and things. And so it took not just a while, not, not like a few months, but but a while. So, and this this is a whole different world that we're working on. I'll stop. Bernie? Yeah, we, we have to say, what does the data tell us? And right now we don't have any data. Um, if you look at the original report that, promoted crafts, um, his staffing was basically hospital shifts. Uh, I used to staff, you know, to have to do draft staffing reports for community residences. And there was no concept of dynamic staff staffing and, and, you know, having staffing to meet need. There was just a, uh, a model that where there were some ar arithmetic errors, I think Sean will record, will request, may, might be, uh, remember my, email to him saying this doesn't add up ah uh, because it doesn't it didn't so so i i think we really need to be careful with this uh, we have to avoid mission creep we have to look at the data uh i think uh, lynn said this a couple of meetings ago that we really need to have an evaluation so let's not let's not go anywhere until we've had it we've got a competent director we apparently have competent staff let's let it settle in let's get some data and then make some decisions on, on where to go and not try to find extra things for Crest to do. The other thing is, is that we, we're assuming that the response times and the availability of our police officers at the present level of staffing is acceptable. And it may not be. And if Crest can relieve, say, as Cahoots does and uh, out, out on the other side of the country, uh, 10 to 15 percent of the calls, uh, we should be relying on that to make our police department more effective and more efficient and more responsive. Uh, you, you know, you, um, you look at it as a package as opposed to one versus the other. Thanks. Thanks, Bernie. I, you know, I use shorthand of peak load staffing, but that's exactly what I meant, that you just don't staff up. You You actually know what the demand is in the data patterns, time of day, types of services, and and we are really so early um, in all of this. Yeah. Very there's early. A, yeah, there's there's a dozen different ways to do that. There's software available now to do that instead of having to sit down with a schedule and do things by hand. Um, and that's what we really need to understand because we're going to be investing a lot in people. Uh, and so we want to make sure that we have the right people at the right place at the right times and not just sitting around uh, uh, on the, the dog watch uh, wondering if uh, um, if anything can happen. So, yeah. Hey, uh, I don't have much else to say on the subject. I mean, the, the other thing that i have concerned about is that uh, we understand that there are needs for police officers and there are needs for press responders, and in, uh, we're trying to balance the amount and we're trying to get, make sure that there is sufficient staffing uh, on both levels to meet the essential needs uh, as best as we can. And that uh, I've, in doing that, I'm, concerned that we'd be very careful not to put Chris um, responders into positions that uh, ought to be uh, responded to initially by or with police officers. And if we don't have adequate police officers to meet that threshold, that we're not just uh, raising questions about the community and whether we're responding, giving the community the response we need, but we're actually potentially endangering unarmed uh, press responders uh, by putting them in situations that seem inappropriate. That's that's what I've been 
trying to say in my conversations where I've brought this up with uh, the presence of rural Anna. This is a really interesting conversation. And I'm also, as a first time report writer, Andy, what, what you're talking about and a little bit of what other folks are talking about feels out of scope for a part of the reporting of on the budget, no? Or is that, am I really supposed to get into more philosophically what we're believing about the future of crafts in a budget report? Which I'm happy to do, but I think that I know I might have differing opinions from y'all on this too. And so I wanna make sure I'm not getting into something that is dictating the future of a program in a broader sense when I'm writing the finance committee report on this. You know what I mean? I, I, I wanna tread very carefully here. Generally, it's been a summary of um, sort of what you heard during the presentations, okay. if there were any themes of discussion that came up. Um, any major concerns that came up during those discussions. And that's a fair theme to talk about how we're assessing use and things like that and the importance of that. That is absolutely fair and I can include that, but I'm not gonna make any, my plan is not to make any recommendations. Uh, right. that, that feels inappropriate. Okay, right. just, just wanted validation on that. Thank you. Yeah. And, and I wasn't making a recommendation. I was more raising a concern that it is something that we factor in as we learn. I understand, Andy, but I, I think that the way that the way that that concern is framed for you is not necessarily shared by the, the council broadly. And I think that it's valid to to I want to I want to play with it to make sure that I'm capturing your concern without it feeling like any sort of recommendation. But I will I'll figure out how to do that. Yeah, no, I, I think that would be right. And I wouldn't want to make it a recommendation that actually has any teeth to it because it's only that it be considered not because I don't know enough to go beyond that. Lynn, what are you thinking of this? Yeah, on this issue, I just want to go back to data and evaluation. And we're not going to have data and evaluation until as we move into next year and maybe not even fully next year. And so one of the reasons why I withhold judgment at this point on whether I think it's working or not is we don't have either of those. And um, that if anything, I think we just want the report to reiterate the need for data and evaluation. We don't even know evaluation by whom exactly. I think that ultimately it's up to the town manager in large part. So I think that we can do one of two things um, to draw this to a cl close for today's conversation, because I'm not sure we can go farther. One is to go ahead and make a motion today, and the other is to hold the motion. If you're going to make the motion today, it would be something along the lines of moving the finance committee recommend the town council approve the budget as recommended by the town manager. Uh, if you, uh, the other thing we can do is add to that sentence recommended by the town manager um, with uh, consideration given to the additional recommendations made by the finance committee. I think we might want to wait if that's going to be the approach until the 30th and make the motion then after we see if we have agreement on the recommendations as they get framed in the report. Uh, Kathy? Um, well, for one, I don't have to disappear at 2.30 because my husband went to pick up my friend at the train station as we have a, an alternative uh, transportation system here in our household. Um, I would be comfortable doing a motion today. And then if we need to expand it because we have something concrete to say about the budget next week, I'd be fine. But everything I've heard today is to the extent we've talked about if there is free cash, um, 
we weren't going to tie people's hands, you know, and we didn't last time around. So I'm not sure we would be making anything specific for the FY24 budget. Um, since the point was made, if more money becomes available, we'll have to appropriate it. Um, we'll have to make adjustments. So I may be a minority of one, but I, I feel like we've had a lot of meetings on this and you all have been in all of them and I've only been in some of them, but it would be nice to keep it moving. And that's said, you're gonna need drafts of our report. So we, we could focus on the 30th of seeing how far we all got with giving you the sections. You know, I'm assuming we probably need to get them to you by yesterday, but anyway, so I'll stop. Yeah, I have a process comment to what you just said, but I'm going to this hear from Anna first. I think you said tomorrow was the deadline because I always need to know the deadline. Um, due date for me is usually a DO date, so I appreciate the uh, uh, very clear deadlines. And if I got that wrong, then I'm sorry. Um, my question, though, is additional considerations. At this point, it seems like the committee, there has not been a motion made regarding the additional funding for the schools. That would be one of those additional considerations that you're talking about, um, or no? no? I think that at this point, if we make a motion that we're recommending the budget as recommended by the town manager, that that takes care of it because that means we're not recommending any additional funding. and. It, becomes incorporated in the motion. I think what uh, Kathy was suggesting is about free cash. Ultimately, we all there's always the opportunity to do that, but the way that it has to flow is that uh, if additional funds are going to be appropriated uh, from free cash or from any other source, that the sequence is that the town manager recommends a supplemental budget um, as provided in the charter. And that we go through the process of treating the additional funds as a supplemental budget, okay. which is in reality what happened last year with the additional free cash. So, um, could we, we a, oh, sorry. Go ahead. Could we as a finance committee request the town manager request something um that it feels like a stretch on that part but if we were hopeful that that request would come through from from free cash to support the additional requests from the schools is that is that something that the finance committee would make any sort of motion on or it's truly the discretion of the town manager and we would need to just kind of sit back okay. that was the original question on on no including of chapter Oh, gotcha, gotcha, gotcha. You know, do we want to say take, you know, take the school request in under consideration or something? But I, I didn't hear anyone say they wanted to do that. So, but I am, I am so deep on this learning curve that I apologize for not saying it. I think that would, I would be interested in doing that, Kathy, for what that's worth. And you would specifically suggest picking out the school as the one as opposed to anything else for, yes. the reasons, for whatever reasons I'm not stating. Yeah, I mean this, yes, I think that this, this was something that I had said when the budget coordinating group came together at, in public comment was that I was hopeful that they would have increased the allocation to the schools. But again, I, I think that this, for me, this has been more of a process issue in terms of how, uh, in, in terms of timelines of when decisions get made regarding budget um, allocations and, and it not aligning with the schools knowing kind of where their needs were at the time exactly. So I'm just trying to, sorry, sorry. That's okay. There's a motorcycle. My dog has a vendetta against them. I apologize. Um, yeah, I'm sorry. I'm. I feel like I'm trying to learn and legislate at the same time, which has been tough around this one. So I appreciate everyone dealing with me. As yeah, I, I see Sean's hand is up. Um, you know, so I incorporate a question into calling on Sean, and that is whether this kind of recommendation might come out of the process that 
Paul was talking about in his memorandum, and if so, whether that process works in proper timing and sequence. Um, so one quick thing before that, um, just when we do vote on the budget, we do have to vote on the individual recommendation, uh, the individual financial orders, um, especially this year, because we do have a borrowing authorization. Um, no, it wouldn't work in, in the timeline um, because the timeline for that process is really to gear up for next year's budget, um, not this year's budget. Um, again, I think Paul and I have made it clear that our priority is operating budgets and you know we did an extra half percent last year we got it up to three percent this year um i think you know you you can include it you know sort of context in your report that you think we should consider that in, in the fall again um we will I, I can say that we will regardless um the one thing i will say though is just um you know the, the struggle i have with it with sort of if, if the committee was to make a really strong recommendation around it is you don't really even know what the it's going to be used for. It, um, you know, at this point, you know, it would go into a reserve uh, for the outcome of, of negotiations. Um, you know, you've, you've got some thoughts around maybe what it would be used for, but um, I don't know how you would make that recommendation, not really knowing, you know, because it wasn't in the superintendent's proposal, right? It was, um, so that's just, those are my two cents, but, um, but I, I can, tell you we will consider in the fall um so again probably a more broad approach not the, the targeted approach like what's being discussed here but um but you certainly can obviously provide that uh, in your report if you want to thank you luckily this isn't my section of the report but i appreciate it thank you yeah and there's, there's one other element to this sean and then uh let us see your hand up so i not ignore it um when uh it was brought up at the meeting at the, earlier in May um, by Allison, there was a, I think that the implication would have been at that point that if they had had the $84,000 and they were committed to use it to retain a position, they couldn't retain more than one. They were talking about really six positions, but they certainly could have uh, done one or one in a fraction, and uh, that they would have needed to know now. They can't, by the time you get around to the fall, it'll be too late. So there is a timing problem from that side, too. Right. Because... And the other thing is, that, and I would have to go back and watch the video, I don't recall what the superintendent or um, what the super, superintendent said they would do if the funding was approved um okay, I, I thought i thought the i thought what we heard was that it you know it potentially would be set aside until we know the outcome of negotiations but i could be filling the blanks there in a way that's not help, helpful so i would have to go back and watch but um but i know that there's that uncertainty there i don't think that the superintendent said anything on the topic okay. as i recall because i did listen to that section again um afterwards uh, i think it was the only section that i uh, where i went back and we did a whole meeting and that was uh so i don't recall it was it was discussed at um by the superintendent nor was it discussed by uh allison in particular because uh it, her statements were more along in the principle of the extent of the need as opposed to how they would meet the need. And it was only because it was built around a motion from the school committee uh, that uh, was not unanimously adopted by the school committee. It was a three to two vote uh, in which they said they identified a number of positions that uh, they felt uh, were um, being cut that they would not like, they would like to preserve if possible. Yeah, and just Andy, one of the questions, just to round out this discussion, one of the questions was um, something around the school committee motion implies that um, says the intention, of, this was one of the responses I thought we got from the schools, that the intention of the school committee's motion 
uh, was to restore three paraeducator positions, lowering the FTE cut from 10 to seven, and to encourage the superintendent and finance director to make those three restorations be the, the library paras. I think that was the response in uh, related to the question of uh, the additional funding. Which is why I said it created an implication that that's, that they would add it, that they would bring a position back, not that they would put it into a reserve for the salary. Yeah, reduction. again, I don't know. If, I don't recall the superintendent responding to how they would specifically do it, I guess. Um, but that was, I think, the school, what the response was to the school committees, which I think they said at the meeting, their intent. But ultimately, the superintendent yeah, no, decides it's, how it's, the funds are allocated. Lynn? So I checked last year's motions and um, where we had a similar situation. I think it was, I can't remember what it was the basis for last year. We did not include it in our motions for adopting the budget. And yet, as Sean mentioned, in the fall, when we are looking at free cash, assuming we have some, uh, that this is always an area where recommendations are often made. And we will have free cash. It's just whether we have more than 5% in free cash is really the, if we have no free cash, then I'm in big trouble, so. Just trying to make sure people aren't thinking we're going to have eight hundred thousand. Right. right, right, right. Yeah. So, Andy, just and you asked whether we wanted to take motions. Sean said we have more than one motion, so it, it may be that we need to wait for Tuesday. So we do it uh, systematically. And I have the orders. I can either bring them up today or send them out, so you have them all. Um, whatever's easiest. Okay. So why don't we hold it since I. Uh, Athena was, had written the uh, agenda to allow us to come back and make motions um, at the next meeting also. So is there anything else that anyone wants to raise today about the budget discussion? Because otherwise, I think we've had a um, pretty robust and uh, discussion about it. So I have a, not about the budget, but about the report, Andy, um, in the questions with answers that Sean has been collecting, and then some of them he's filled in with the answers. Are you going to feature that, the answers and questions as an appendix? Um, are you going to just cross list it to the various meetings? I'm just looking in terms of, um, it how the broader public knows there's been this. Um, and I leave that up to you. I mean, it's, there's been a lot of work on back and forth. And sometimes, Sean, you you took an easy way, which says answer during meeting. <laughs> so it, it wasn't a you know four sentence answer on the thing. So so I just I, I like that process that we've developed. And um I'm I'm not telling you what to do. I'm just saying when you think about the report, figure out how you reference them. And if they're all posted in each meeting, you can just hot link to the answers. Um, so, because we got a lot of information just by having those conversations, I think. Yeah, no, I think that what I'm gonna have to do is uh, put everybody's report together and then for each section, go back and as I read each section, see if the answers within the section and if the if it's not explicitly there considering taking an amended for uh i don't want sean to have to do any more work nor could he in a reasonable way anyway uh, just take this uh, questions that have more than just that brief answer um they actually have the, a substantive response and incorporate that as an appendix would be an alternative uh -huh. but if to see if it duplicates what's already in what's being written then uh, it wouldn't be necessary so i'll take a look at that as i draft I invite you to do the same lynn yeah i i just ask that you let me know because i did not provide written 
responses to the questions that were asked. I answered them during the meeting. Yeah, and with, that, that's why I didn't write them because I wasn't going to yeah. try to. With regard to my report in the library, I, I did go back to the questions I asked and where I felt it wasn't covered in the budget book or it, I, and it wasn't covered in my report. I went back and added more into the report to cover it. And if I do anything, it's only going to be to provide the, as I said, the questions that have a substantive answer to it that's more than just a reference to what happened at the meeting. You know, I'll just edit the document and then make it an attachment if that seems like an appropriate thing to do. But I don't want to lose the effort that we went through and John went through to get those in the questions he answered that he did answer. So with that said, um, do we want to just uh, take care of the minutes and uh, see if anybody has any unanticipated business? And if not, because we have no public comment and there's nobody in the public at this point. There were three sets of minutes that were um, provided and You've now seen them in a revised fashion. The revisions were uh, not large. Uh, there weren't any big things. They were mostly about wording uh, and uh, name designations and uh, one attendance thing. Uh, I don't know if anybody else has had a chance to look at them. But if anybody is comfortable, has additional changes, please let me know right now. And if not, we'll see if we're ready to make a motion. I'm ready to make a motion that we approve all three sets of minutes as amended. Okay. Um, Second. So I'm going to write it as a motion to approve the minutes. I'll just list the dates of December 6, 2022. January 10th and January 24th, 2023, and approve mass amended. Um, and I second. Kathy making the motion and uh, Lynn seconding. Yes. Um, so going to vote then, Anna. Aye. Uh, Lynn. Aye. Bob. Uh, support. Matt. 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 We can go back to them one more time in a second. Bernie. Support. Uh, Kathy. Yes. Amy, yes. And Alicia is absent. Matt. I'll just, that may have stepped away. Um, so I'll uh, put into the minutes, uh, not, but not indicating support or not support, and I'll write it that way. Um, so any other unanticipated business? If not, I think that uh, we're done for the day. And thank you. This has been a good meeting and a good discussion. Thanks, everyone. So we can make this all come together. Have good weekend, weekend, everyone. Have a nice have a great, day. great weekend. See everybody on Tuesday. Thank you. Okay, <laughs> take care.